I see you, Aaron. You're smiling big. Looks good. It's great to see you today. It's great to see everybody here today. Uh, about two weeks ago, we started a new series called All In, and I started to think about my summer. Um, for some reason this summer, I felt like my motto for myself was all in. And no matter what I would do, no matter what I had planned to do, I would go all in. And back in, gosh, early June, um, we did, our church did something called Family Fun Fest. And I had asked Corey Nelson and Julie Lighthoff uh, what help they needed. And they just said, we just needed to be there all day long. And I'm like, all right, there's a 8 to 6 p.m. shift. And so I thought, Jimmy, you're going to go all in with everything that you do. And I'm not using this as a pun, like that was really my motto, but I'm going to do, I'm going to go all in with everything uh, in regards to Family Fun Fest. Um, throughout the day, I think I ran probably 15, 20 miles. Uh, one of my goals was to uh, try to connect with and say hi to all of our volunteers who were there, which you guys are amazing people. Um, I think I hit almost every single person. But by the end of the day, I think it was about 8 or 8.30 that night, I'm getting out of my car. We had just unloaded everything into the storage garage. And I'm like, oh my gosh, my body is just about ready to just fall apart. And then the next morning I got up and I don't know if you know, like, if you're moving back and forth, there's like friction going on the areas that are moving back and forth. I don't know what I wore wrong that day, but I had some chafing going on. And the next morning, I'm like, I'm literally like walking like this, and my wife's following me around with like, you know, ointments and stuff and trying to like fix me. It wasn't so much like up here or like down there. It was, well, here's a picture. I'm just kidding. I don't have a picture. <laughs> but I was, I was satisfied because I went all in, and I thought, you know what? You got to give up a little bit of things to, uh, to, to serve people. So, um, and then it was the following week. Um, Ashley Wietrich, our next gen director, said, hey, can you help us out at Summer Blast? It's a week long. I'm like, I know what Summer Blast is. And I'm like, what do you need? And she goes, I need you to do this, 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 and this. And I said, like, you know what, Ashley? Whatever you need me to do, I will do it. And that was a blast. Like, literally, it was a blast in the summer for a whole week. Um, it's awesome. I can't wait for next year. And so um, I needed to go on vacation after that because that kind of is, a, it just wears you down. And I went all in with my visa card on vacation over the next couple of weeks. And so I feel satisfied that I did that. And then um, not too long after that, I get back in Devon, our middle school ministry leader said, hey, Jimmy, we need a mature fatherly figure to come with us on our rooted camp to set the example of how one should live. And I'm like, you know, I can do that. And so, but what do you need from me? And he goes, I will tell you when to get there. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll go. But first off, how's the coffee? What's the coffee situation? And he goes, I'm not even going to tell you. And I thought, okay, whatever. We got there. Coffee was disgusting. Most coffee is disgusting, except for the kind that I make. And we get there. And as we, at, right after we got done with this like eight hour long charter bus ride, I think you guys remember the charter bus ride. That was a lot of fun. That's the way to travel these days. Um, after being there for eight, uh, getting on that thing for eight hours, we get off. Devin rounds us all up and he goes, hey, leaders, here's some things for you to remember. But I need one thing from you all week long. And I'm like, here it comes. So what's he need from us? This is what the students need. This is what you need. This is what the camp needs. I need you guys to go full send. And I'm like, okay, wait, stop. What the heck does full send mean? And to clarify, there's a D at the end of send. Someone thought I said full send, uh, first gathering. Full send. And I'm like, what's full send? And he goes, well, okay, Father Jimmy, old man Jimmy. It's like going all in. We need you to go all in with everything that you do. All day, every day, you're going to be up late. You're going to be doing things you don't want to do. And I'm like, all right, that's kind of my motto. So I will go full send this week. I hate high ropes courses. Your body sometimes doesn't want to let go of stable things. Everything on your feet, like your feet just won't pick up. I remember hiding in a prickly, stickly, uh, sticky bush that you crawl into and then your body itches for like days and it hurts. There were slugs crawling up my jeans. We were playing hide-and-go-seek doing that stuff. I hate pranks because I think they are cruel. And I remember in middle school camp, I had some pranks pulled on me that maybe have just scarred me for life. But, so I don't like them. But somebody pranked me. And so I got the experience to get on Google and how do you prank people at camp. 
and I had melted a couple of milkshakes all day long and eventually dumped those on a couple of girls' heads. But then immediately felt bad for doing that, and so I made sure that we had like a forgiveness circle going on and that we weren't going to hate each other at the end of the trip. But let me tell you, it was a very fun trip. I enjoyed all of the kids at Summer Blast, uh, Rooted Camp. Like, you guys have some amazing children, and I am so happy to have been around them. They've taught me a lot. Um, But when I look back at my summer, I thought, and I've even talked to my wife about this, I'm like, we have an amazing church. Like, I just love these people so much. I love you guys so much. You guys are awesome. And so, so far this year, we've also had about 55 people put their faith in Jesus. And it's only, not even August yet, so the first six months, I think that deserves a round of applause. If you're watching online, we celebrate with you today. I got this trophy, I forgot to show you this. I think I did a good job going full send at Rooted Camp and this summer that somebody gave me this flag. And if you can see it, it says full send. So I think that's a good trophy. I don't know about you, but clap for me. I'm just kidding. I'm just going to throw this right down there. I was going to hang it there, but they were on the bus with us. But again, uh, we are in our third and final week of our series called All In. And throughout this series, we are talking about how to become a fully committed follower of Jesus, or better yet, what it requires of us in order to become a fully, follower, a fully committed follower of Jesus. Not partially committed, because there's no such thing as partially committed to Jesus, but a fully committed follower of Jesus. Or in Devin's terms, the middle school terms, what's it look like to go full send with Jesus, right? Well, if you're checking out this whole Jesus thing today, or maybe you've been following him for quite some time, but you feel like you're missing something out, wherever you are on your journey with him, our hope for you is that you are able to understand just a little bit more about Jesus as we dig into this topic of what it means to be a fully committed follower of Jesus. And as we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, Jesus has extended an invitation for all people to follow him. All people everywhere, no one is excluded. All nations, all races, all types of people, all religious backgrounds, to the poorest, to the most wealthy, to the alcoholic, the pothead, the addict, the hypocrite, all of them. No matter what your sexual past, he invites you. All ex-cons, anyone. Current cons, any current cons in here? We had one last gathering, so that was kind of interesting. He invites them too. And he promises that when we do, when we choose to follow him, that we will find life. But what kind of life? We talk about life a lot. What kind of life? Well, when we accept his invitation to put our faith in him and we trust him in his death and resurrection, and we ask him to be the forgiver of our sins and leader of our life, our sins are forgiven and we receive eternal life. But not just eternal life, but life and life to the full, here and now, every minute of our day, every single area of our life. Well, leads us to another question. What is life to the full? We've talked about that in here many times, but what is life to the full? Well, for starts, it's not material things. It's not having access to anything you could ever want or working hard and earning a bunch of money or becoming your own boss. And it's not being able to build your own spaceship and launch yourself into space and back on a Tuesday, still wondering how that stuff works. No, according to what Jesus both taught and lived, life to the full is being able to walk and live in the identity in which God has created you. Life to the full is being fully satisfied deep down in your soul. Life to the full is being able to stand strong when everyone around you is falling down or trying to tear you down. Life to the full is peace, no matter what situation is before you. It's confidence to walk through any trial or temptation or to fight any battle that is placed before you, and it's truly knowing that you have meaning and purpose. It's joy and contentment, no matter what trial you're going through, even when what could be called the most hopeless situation is before you. That is what life to the full is. 
It's unexplained security when things seem to be crumbling down around you. It's living with a heart that's overflowing with generosity that you cannot simply give enough away. And it's being able to love and be loved in such a way that no one could ever understand or explain. The list goes on, but ultimately, it's this. Being able to really know God and really understand his experience Experience him and the power and the presence of him in every single part of your life. Quick survey. Who in here thinks they might want that kind of life? I do. I want it every single day. Well, thankfully, that kind of life is possible. Praise be to God. But Jesus gave us a warning. And for some, this warning is just a reminder. For others, this might answer some of the questions that you've been asking. Jesus said that there is a thief... And that thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy everything about you. Everything about you. He wants to take everything from you. He wants to crash your families, destroy your marriages, destroy your friendships. He wants to confuse your identity and make you hate yourself. He makes you want to question everything and everyone and trust no one. And he wants to turn you into something that you were never created to be and distract you from becoming everything that God has created you to be. And ultimately, this thief wants to try and lead you to and through the doorway of death. Now I bet some of you this week felt like you were experiencing the doorway of death in your life. But here's the good news. Unlike the thief, Jesus didn't come to take and wreck your life. He says, no, I've come to give you life. And I've come to lead you to and through the doorway of life. All you have to do is let go of everything that you are trying to carry and take my hand. And I will lead you to an everlasting abundant life directly to my Father, the one true God, the author of life, the creator of life, who knows you, who created you, and loves you, and who's prepared something for you that is far better than anything you could ever imagine. But It's going to require something of you. I can give this to you, but it's going to require something of you. It's going to require that you follow me. Not the world. Me. Not the world's wisdom. Me. Not your friends or their terrible advice. Me. Not the social media influencers. Not your current feelings. Not even your own heart. You have to follow me. Now, we've been spending some time looking at what Jesus said about what's required of us in order to follow him. And we've been hanging out in a passage found in the book of Luke, uh, chapter 9, verse 23, and Jesus speaking says this, whoever, that's for anyone, wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. And in this first week of our series, we spent some time defining what a disciple is. And in short, a disciple is a student of his or her teacher. And this disciple would do whatever his teacher did and would go wherever his teacher went. But in short, a disciple is and was fully committed and fully submitted to his teacher. If you haven't had a chance yet to listen to uh, that that week's uh, one message, Pastor Jeremy did an amazing job. Um, with that one and explaining what disciple is. Uh, It's probably been the very best one that I've ever heard on that topic. But last week, we spent some time on the second portion of this passage, and it's this. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Pastor Andy spent some time teaching about that, but in a culture where everything revolves around self, protect yourself, promote yourself, preserve yourself, entertain yourself, comfort yourself, Take care of yourself, serve yourself, love yourself, meme yourself. Jesus said, oh no, not you, not my followers. You must do the complete opposite and you must deny yourself. Congratulations, you are in last place. And you're gonna hang out there for your entire life. Sounds great, Jesus. But this is hard. Where do I deny myself and deny myself Of what? Because this seems like a little bit more of a commitment, but guess what? Jesus did not stop there. He didn't stop there. He says, actually, 
it's going to require even more of you. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily. And this is where we're going to camp out for the rest of the day. What does that mean? What does it mean to take up your cross daily? Well, for the rest of our time together, I want you to do something for me. Really, you're not doing it for me. You're doing it for yourself. But um, just for a moment, I want you to just imagine that sitting on the chair next to you or maybe in the floor in front of you is like a cross. You know, like not like a little thing. Like we got, we got some little ones, but not like it's got to be like a big cross, right? You can't miss it. So I want you to think just for a moment that you have that sitting on the chair next to you. Maybe if you're still sleeping or kind of, kind of awake and you're watching this online, just imagine it's laying in your bed next to you or up against the wall. And actually, let's go a little bit farther so you know that you're not the only one with one of those things. Will you just look around the room, make eye contact with somebody? No one's, no one's doing it yet. I want you to look around the room. You just made eye contact with a stranger. Now it's weird. Everybody's wondering what's going to happen right now. Look at your mom, look at your dad, look at your kids. I don't really care. But just does everybody, everybody in here has a cross, okay? Everybody imagine one of those things. What does it mean to take up or pick up that thing every single day? What does that mean? Well, we see crosses almost everywhere we go. And it, see, and it means different things to different people. We see them driving down the road. You might see them on buildings. Uh, people wear them around their necks as jewelry or earrings. People have them tattooed on their bodies. People kiss them after praying. Some people use these as decoration in their home. But no matter what you think of, uh, about the cross, I bet we all have something in common in here. When we think about the cross, most of us probably think about something religious. But just like how the cross means different things to different people, the same thing goes for what Jesus said in that statement, to take up your cross daily. People understand that in different ways. So what did Jesus mean? Well, first, let's talk about what he doesn't mean. Many people have often interpreted take up your cross as some type of burden they must carry in their lives in order to follow Jesus, almost like a punishment tool. And that's fair, I get it, because Jesus did have to die on a cross. He did have to carry one. It's heavy, it's painful. It was definitely a burden all the way up to his death. And of course, there is physical pain. That's fair, I get why people might think that. But as such, picking up their cross for them too is a burden that they must carry. Example, maybe they have a terrible job. Maybe you have a terrible job. And you're like, this is just my cross to carry. This is my burden to bear. Maybe, I, maybe you have a physical illness or a relationship that is strained, and this is just your burden to bear. Maybe you have a constant reminder of a mistake. Whatever it is, people say things like, well, this is my cross to carry. And they're kind of proud of it. Or it's part of being a follower of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, Lord. And they just kind of go crazy with this stuff. It's like, Jesus is trying to punish them, but they're happy about it. I don't think that's what Jesus meant. Back when Jesus walked the earth, the cross meant one thing and one thing only. The cross meant death. And death by the most painful and humiliating way that a human could ever experience. The cross meant execution by crucifixion. Now, what is that? There's a few different ways. There were a few different ways to crucify someone back in those days. But one of the most common ways is, I mean, we all kind of know what the cross looks like, is the cross is laying on the ground. And these Roman soldiers would lay someone's body on the cross. They're alive. And they'd wrap some rope around each of the arms to kind of keep them from being able to pick up because nobody wants to be crucified. But they would put the ropes around there. And then they would take these large nails, around seven inches long, is probably, think like a, a railroad tie, like think, think about something that big, and they would drive that through their wrists into the, uh, the wood of the cross um, because they wanted them to be able to support their weight with their wrists. And then they moved down to the feet and they'd cross the feet over and they'd kind of bend the knees a little bit, stick a block under there, and they'd nail a nail right through their feet and so that they couldn't move their feet around. 
And then if that wasn't bad enough, they'd take the cross once they have them strapped down and they would start lifting that cross up and then it would slam into the hole, which that's gotta be a little bit painful. It would slam into the hole and then that, the person being crucified would be left there for up to three days in full sight of everyone. Why three days? Well, normally you would die within three days, but also because they wanted to make sure that everyone saw that this person had fully submitted to the Roman soldiers. And it was humiliating and it was painful. And sometimes if the person on the cross wasn't dying quick enough, they would actually go and break the legs of that person so that all the weight now would be, it would suffocate them. And it was a terrible thing. If you have not seen anything like this, um, a movie you could watch, a lot of us have probably seen it, would be The Passion um, is, a, is a good example of what that looks like. But that was execution by crucifixion. So why in the world then would Jesus invite people to follow him and use that as an example? Because let's be honest, we could probably figure out a better way or a better symbol to invite people with, like, I don't know, a shepherd's staff or a fluffy white sheep or something comfortable like that. Or maybe a crown or a, a hug or, or unlimited Chick-fil-A to make you wanna follow Jesus. I feel like we talk about Chick-fil-A every week here. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Jesus had a specific purpose for using the cross as a symbol. When Jesus said, whoever wants to be his disciple must deny himself and take up his cross daily, he meant that in order for someone to follow him, something has to die. Well, what is Jesus referring to? What has to die? Well, let me tell you this. No person takes up a cross and lives. So the better question is, who has to die? Who has to die? You. You have to die. If you choose to follow Jesus, he is saying that you have to die. And not just once, he says, every single day. Okay, Jimmy. Last week, Andy said that I only had to deny myself. I'm on board with that, but now you're saying that I actually have to die to myself. Bring Andy back, bring Andy back. <laughs> now you understand why they, the elders of our church, Jeremy and Andy, led me, or left me to be the bad guy to preach this message, but I guess that's what it looks like to submit to your elders. When Jesus said whoever wanted to follow him would not only have to deny themselves, they would also have to actually die to themselves. Not die by themselves, but die to themselves. And what's that look like? Well, let's continue to unpack this a little bit more. The Apostle Paul, who wrote a lot of the second half of the Bible, begins to give us a hint of what this looks like, and he gives us a couple of key words that I'd like to pull out of here. There's so much to talk about in regards to this, but we'll start here. He says, and he's talking about, talking to people who follow Jesus, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit, what he means by that is when you've put your faith in Jesus by asking him to be a forgiver of sins, leave your life, he gives you the spirit to live within you. But if you live by the spirit and put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Okay, well, first off, let's dissect this a little bit. What is our flesh? What's our flesh? We're probably thinking about skin right now. But all throughout uh, the New Testament, our flesh is often described as or refers to our physical body or our natural self or everything about us, really. And our flesh naturally craves comfort and pleasure and to preserve itself and to stay alive. But our flesh is also described in uh, scripture as having a sin nature. And even worse, that our flesh is a gateway to sin. And not only that, the writers of scripture say that our flesh is naturally weak. And as such, when tempted, if we do not hold our flesh under control, because it likes to be in control, it produces what Paul calls the works of the flesh. And he says that if we live according to the works of the flesh, we will die. Well, what are the works of the flesh? 
Well, thankfully, Paul always knows the, answer, the questions that we are asking. For example, Paul says, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality. We're actually gonna be talking more about this in September. Impurity, debauchery, that's like habitual and unrestrained indulgence of lust. Idolatry, having something other than God be your God. Everything in your life revolves around something. Um, A person other than God himself, sports could be an idol. People could be an idol. Your own body could be an idol. Money, what people think about you could be an idol. Witchcraft, and that's not something that we ever really talk about every day. Uh, Witchcraft isn't a word that we just use in our conversations, but witches, people still call themselves witches. Mediums, spiritism, talking to the dead, channelers, channeling, psychics, dealing with the energies of a person, fortune telling, doing magic, meditation to bring out the powers of your inner self, dealing with crystals and potions, all of this stuff falls under the headline of of witchcraft and uh, scripture strictly forbids it because there's only one spirit that we need to be following and that's the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Everything else is forbidden. He goes on to say hatred, discord, that's like constant lack of harmony, disunity, Um, People just stirring some stuff up, constant disagreements, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition. That's like only thinking about yourself and elevating yourself at the cost of what doesn't really matter, of anyone. Like they just, it's all about me. Dissensions, uh, that's like a person who's just constantly fighting, being one who constantly divides. I would put gossip as a tool for this or someone who's just stirring the pot. That's kind of what dissensions mean. Factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, these are all works of the flesh. And this isn't a total list, but you get the idea. But they are such a big deal that Paul goes on to say that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot going on in this passage that we don't have time to get into today, but the kingdom of God is everything that God has for you. Everything he's trying to usher in here and now. The life, the joy, the security, the peace, the purpose, his power, everything that we talked about earlier, and then some. But if we live according to the flesh, if we live according to these things, Paul says we will die because our flesh leads us to sin and sin leads us to death. But thankfully, Paul doesn't leave us there wondering, okay, then what? Again, he tells us. He says of, instead of giving into your flesh and living by your flesh, Paul says in a very similar way to what Jesus said, that those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh along with its passions and its desires. Again, in Paul's day, execution by crucifixion on the cross was the vilest, most shameful form of death, and Paul wanted his readers, those who follow Christ, to understand that the flesh is not to be treated with respect or kindness or even indifference. It deserves nothing. Our flesh deserves nothing, and why? Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, we have been delivered from sin and death to new life in Christ. And so we are called to put to death whatever, whatever belongs to our flesh. Or as Paul put it, go to the ultimate extreme and crucify our flesh. So that we can give ourselves completely, fully submitted, fully committed to God and what God wants to do, not just in us, but through us. He wants to do stuff through us. But we must know that crucifying our flesh, in order for you to crucify your flesh, it's gonna be humiliating. It's gonna be humbling. There's gonna be suffering. And it's gonna be painful. But to crucify our flesh is to obey the call of Jesus' invitation and discipleship and is required in order to be able to follow Jesus because we can't follow Jesus if we are following our flesh. We cannot do it. Flesh leads to death. Again, Paul says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now there's another interesting word that I like to point out here and that is have, H-A-V-E, have. 
have crucified. He used this term because this is a decision that you make, not one that somebody makes for you, not something that Jesus makes for you, but it's a decision that you make. And it's almost the same thing as what Jesus said when he said, take up or pick up your cross. You are taking up your cross. You are crucifying your flesh in whatever way it needs to be crucified. And ultimately, you are dying to yourself. But this is not a one-time decision. It's not a one and done. Jesus said, pick up your cross daily. This is not a checkbox that you simply do on one Sunday morning or 10 years ago and then you've finished. It's an everyday decision, an everyday decision death. Every day we die to our own desires. We we die to our own wills and our own dreams and our own plans and instead follow Jesus and what he has for us and everything he wants to do in us and through us. When our feet hit the ground every single morning, I don't know if you have carpet or if you had hardwood or you have tile, I don't know, but the moment you get out of that bed every single morning and those feet hit the ground, we should be saying, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. Feet hit the carpet. Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And that's what it means to be a fully committed follower of Jesus. But not just saying that, but actually doing those things. Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I will do it. And then we do it. But here's the reality of it all. This is where most people throw in the towel. And when Jesus used this, when he said this back to everyone who was crowded around him, he lost most of his followers because they're like, I'm not gonna, I'm not doing that. I know what that means and I'm not gonna do that. But this is what distinguishes between simply spectators of Jesus and actual followers of Jesus. Because so many people choose to not follow Jesus out of the fear of what they might lose. Fear that they will have to walk away from a relationship. Fear of walking away from what they think is a perfectly good life. Fear of losing their family members. I know I I, I hear a lot, people who've grown up in the Catholic Church will say, my family has kind of disowned me since I've been a part of this church or that church or whatever the case is. So we know what that looks like. And Muslims really know what this looks like. Fear of loss of fun with my friends, or maybe you're gonna, Jesus asked me to stop sleeping with my boyfriend or girlfriend, or what if you're asking me to move out? Fear of loss of comfort or wealth or desires and dreams for your own life, or fear of losing your cool reputation. I know a lot of men, we don't wanna tell people that we're following Jesus because we think it's not as cool as what it really is. And we're afraid of our reputation being hurt in that way. But the reality is, If Jesus promises us life and life to the full and he asks us to do these things, there must be a reason he would lead us away from those things. And so what do we have to lose? The truth is it's only by dying to ourselves daily that we have the ability to fully surrender ourselves and follow Jesus wherever he leads. But this takes great faith because we don't always know what's on the other side of that wall. We don't always know what's on the other end of the corner. This takes great faith and it takes great trust in Jesus that he is actually gonna stick to his word. Now in case some of you are thinking what I think you're thinking, when we begin to follow Jesus, this doesn't mean that we suddenly become perfect and that we have it all together. It does not mean that. But this does mean that we make a decision to work hard to break with our old way of living and take a turn into a new way of living in our new life in Jesus. And this happens only one step at a time. We talk about next steps here all the time, one step at a time, step one, step two, step three, 500 steps. We all talk about 10,000 steps a day. Imagine what your life's gonna look like after taking 10,000 steps with Jesus. Imagine what that's gonna look like for you. When we begin to go wherever Jesus says to go or whenever Jesus says to go or do whatever he wants us to do or give whatever he tells us to give, it becomes easier. You know why? Because we die and Jesus lives. Paul says, 
I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. If you're a follower of Jesus, you no longer live. Christ lives in you. And when we die to ourselves, he lives in us. We work hard to die daily and fully surrender to Jesus and everything in us starts to change. Our minds begin to change. Our desires begin to change. Our wills begin to change. And supernaturally, not naturally, supernaturally, our reason for living begins to change. When we commit to go all in with Jesus, we say, Jesus, today, Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. What I have and who I am, it no longer matters. You matter. My security, my comfort, no longer matters. Every day when your feet hit the floor, Jesus, whatever you want me to do today, I'll do it. Now I get it. This can make us uneasy and anxious and fearful at times, it does me, and it seems like just when I thought I have followed Jesus everywhere that I could go, he has a new place for me to follow him, and I'm like, here we are again, my flesh is fighting me. It's kind of like chips and salsa at midnight. You know you shouldn't do it because it's destroying your health, but you do it anyway, and then you finally make it without having it for one night, and then you text all your friends, you're like, I did it. Next night, movie comes on, chips and salsa one step at a time. Our flesh hates when we crucify it and deprive it of things. Following Jesus demands sacrifice and Jesus never hid that cost. But he requires your allegiance, he demands your sacrifice, he commands your obedience, but it's worth it and better yet, Jesus is worth it. As we're coming for a close, I want to ask you to do something. Do you remember that imaginary cross that is sitting next to you? Um, I want you to imagine this. I'm going to ask you a question. And whatever comes to your mind, I want you to just picture you writing that on a piece of paper and nailing that to the cross. And you're going to pick it up and start walking. Okay, so I'm going to have a question. You're going to nail whatever comes to your mind to the cross and you're going to pick it up. This should be something that you do every single day. Here's the question. What is keeping you from going all in with Jesus? Is there something keeping you from going all in with Jesus? In order for us to pick up that cross, we have to lay something down. And that's our life. Is there anything that's keeping you from going all in with Jesus? Is it a distraction? We have a lot of distractions in this world. One of my distractions was the Facebook app, not because of Facebook, but because that stupid news button they stuck on there. And every second you can just click it and there's something new on there. And it just makes you feel hopeless. And so I'm like, I don't need that in my life. Like it's distracting me. Netflix could be a distraction. Your job could be a distraction. I don't know, your friends that you're circled around with could be a distraction. Sin, unforgiveness, bitterness, fear of losing something. What is keeping you from going all in with Jesus? Quickly, I want to talk to those who have not yet put your faith in Jesus because you have the ability to accept that invitation as well. Um, I don't know where you are on your spiritual journey with Jesus. I don't know where you're watching from today. But Jesus is extending that invitation to you as well. And he wants to give you life. He has so much stuff for you. He has so much to give you. Your first step, your step one is to say, all right, Jesus, I surrender my life. I want to give it to you. If that's you, if you want to accept Jesus' invitation today, I want you to pray with me. Pray, Jesus. I ask you to come into my life. I've been trying to do this thing on my own and I cannot. Help me follow you and surround me with people to help me follow you. I'm yours today. Tell me what to do next. In Jesus' name, amen.